Welcome to Sundays at Cafe Tabac, the podcast. Hi, I'm Wanda Costa. Hi, I'm Karen Song. We're the filmmakers of the documentary feature film project of the same name that's still in progress. This podcast series is an extension of our film's mission to affirm and extol the courage, vision, strength, and joy in our LGBTQ community through the preservation and sharing of our personal stories and the collective histories we live through and change. We often discuss whether it is still necessary to come out today, since there is a level of acceptance and visibility that did not exist in the past, with many rights won for our community. We also discuss coming out as a celebratory and self-empowering moment in one's life. But we want to also acknowledge that for many, it is still very difficult and unsafe to do so. For all of these reasons, we want to emphasize why we do this podcast, because we believe these stories were as timely then as they are now. We believe in the importance of telling and preserving our personal stories and our collective histories as forms of visibility and activism and as sources for empowerment and inspiration. On this episode, we welcome Kimberly Bliss, a Philippine-born, Buffalo-bred, and Brooklyn-borough novelist for hire. Her work has appeared in Hobart and Dime Show Review. She was a 2020 resident at the New Orleans Writers Residency and this summer's guest fiction editor at Hobart. She is currently working on her great American novel set in the Philippines entitled Leaving Manila. Find her online at KimberlyBliss.com and on Twitter at Blister. This podcast episode was recorded at the newsstand studios at One Rockefeller Plaza in New York City. Now let's listen to Kimberly Bliss's story. So we have to uh, bring it back, way back to... 1986 in Buffalo, New York, which is everything one with an imagination would think it is. Since probably 14, I just had crushes on girls, and unsurprisingly, they were cheerleaders. (laughs) Didn't really know what it meant. You know, there was no Google, certainly, or internet or anything like that. So what I did was Um, I had just been mulling it in my head, you know, living with this, you know, any other teenage desire, but there was nowhere to put it. It wasn't on television. Uh, Media looked very different. It just wasn't in the world, right? It was just this desire I lived with. So I did what any person would do in 1986. I looked up gay in the yellow pages. (laughs) And thank God for this organization I found the Gay and Lesbian Youth of Buffalo. And so they just had a phone number. I just had a rotary phone. So I would just dial the number, hang up, dial the number, hang up. And finally, I dial the number. I talked to them. You know, they said they're an organization for gay and lesbian youth, just like a social organization, right, to hang out. And they were going to have a picnic. So I was really, really, really nervous. I had my first job at a diner kind of restaurant in my neighborhood. The day of the picnic, I had my Huffy, my three-speed Huffy, because that's why I had a job to begin with, was to pay for that bike. So I rode that bike from my job all the way to where the picnic was. And the picnic was in Delaware Park, which is this really beautiful park in downtown Buffalo near the art gallery. But it's, you know, a good 45-minute bike ride from where I was. And in order to get to the park, you had to ride your bike over an overpass. And I literally like rode my bike back and forth over that overpass like a dozen times. Like, should I go? Should I not go? Should I go? By the time I get there, I am like drenched in sweat and out of breath. And there was about maybe 12 other kids there. Uh, Most of them were a little bit older than me, like around 18. I was so nervous, and when I got there, I was so disappointed because they just looked like regular people, you know? And I was like, oh, so being gay is not spectacular or difficult or any of these things. Like, in my head, it was just absent, you know, in the world. From there, that, like, changed my world because it was now being gay was just a regular part of the world you know, for me. And it obviously became more complicated as I started hanging out with people. 
a lot of kids, they were, you know, living on the streets because their parents threw them out, you know, and the reality of what it means to be gay in, you know, 1986 in upstate New York in a world that is certainly not accepting of it is very different, you know. The other thing about the gay and lesbian youth of Buffalo is not only did I come out like to myself, like, okay, this is what it means to be gay. One of the board members owned a bar, MC Compton's. And it was in this section of Buffalo that was just like the far west side, you know, abandoned factories and stuff. And her deal was that if you didn't drink, that you could work coat check at the bar, right? So I was just staying in coat check, watching what to me was like the most beautiful parade of women go by. I had just gotten my driver's license. Like I hadn't come out to my family and I grew up in my grandparents' house with my mom and sister. So what I had to do in order to go to this bar was I would wait until everyone fell asleep and my bedroom was in the attic and I had to walk down creaky steps go past my mother's bedroom, past my grandmother's bedroom, past a poodle and a cockapoo. I had to get in the car, put the car in neutral, because it was like one of those, whatever, regular little city suburban homes, right? Two-story with a porch and a driveway on the right side. So the car was right next to everyone's bedroom. So I had to put the car in neutral, roll the car down the driveway, (laughs) And then push and roll the car down half the block and then start it and go all to hang out with some girls. And that was pretty much the story of the next like 10 years of my life. But one day I came back and they had locked the doors. My mom never talked about it. I never brought it up with my mom and I was locked out of the house. So we had this patio underneath the stairs. I had to shimmy through like a window that was underneath the patio stairs. So it wasn't like a real window. It was like a skinny rectangular window. And then I was locked in the basement. So my grandfather's tools were down there because someone had then locked the door in the basement. So I had to take off the hinges of the basement door, put the basement door back on its hinges, and then somehow make it up the stairs, past the poodle and cockapoo, my grandmother's bedroom, my mother's bedroom, and into bed. I got a girlfriend somehow. I don't remember how. I think I met her in the coat check. She was another, like, young queer person, but really messed up um, home situation. And so, of course, we started dating. And one day, I had lied to my mom about studying with a friend, and I had the car, But at that time, you couldn't be out too late because if you're 16, you have to be home by a certain hour. So I missed the curfew because when I was over at her house, my girlfriend told me that, you know, all these things, that she was a recovering addict, that she was living with this guy, but sleeping with him in order to stay with him. And it was just a lot, you know, for a wide-eyed 16-year-old. So when I was driving home, I got totally lost and disoriented because I was just like crying and being all high school dramatic over this breakup. And I had to call my mom from a payphone. And I remember calling her and my mom's, where are you? Is the car okay? Are you okay? And I was like, yeah, everything's fine. And she's like, well, what happened? I thought you were with your friend studying. And I was like, no. I went to see this girl that I met And I just took a really deep breath and I said, the gay and lesbian youth of Buffalo. And she's like, what did you say? And I was like, please don't make me say it again. Anyway, that's how I came out over a payphone. And somehow I went an hour in the wrong direction. You know, she was able to tell me how to get home. After I told my mom on the payphone and she got me home with directions on how to drive home, it was pretty late. And so when I managed to get home, It was like after midnight, I think, and we went to the basement and we just had a conversation. She said, I had no idea. And I said, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. It's either you, you're in love with somebody and either you love a man or you love a woman. It's really not that big a deal, you know? 
she didn't say much. You know, my family is not the say a lot kind of family. But what she did say was, I have to think about this. We'll talk later. No matter what, I love you. You know, we all have very complicated relationships with our parents, and I'm no exception. My mom wasn't necessarily like all rah-rah about it, but how she handled it by just loving me no matter what, I think is like the best case scenario. It's not like we talked about it or anything like that. And I found out later that my mom was a church secretary at Kenmore United Methodist Church, and she spoke with the minister there. Thank God the minister was like, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. It's not a sin, and it's fine. That would not be the normal response, I think, in that era, or maybe even now, I don't know. You know, my mom said that after she spoke with her, then she's like, okay, like, I just have to accept it. I don't have to, like, love it. I can love my daughter, but it was a way for my mom to, like, hold what I told her and move on. I'm adopted, so my family there, white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestants. Emotions are not something that you show, let alone communicate. So, (laughs) I mean, in some regards, mostly not, but in some regards, it worked in my favor. The being gay part felt fine. Like, I told my friends they didn't care. I didn't particularly care for, you know, the social scene in high school anyways. So it's not like I was bummed about never having the opportunity to be prom queen or king, as it were. Self-acceptance, I am who I am kind of thing, comes very easy to me. And so that wasn't the hard part. I think the harder part was going through what everyone else is going through in your adolescence when it comes to dating and relationships and crushes and not having the peer support for it. You know, I feel like my friends would go through crushes and everything else. And like the entire world was built around high school relationships and love interests. Your entire support system is, you know, functions around, you know, that access. And my access was different. And I felt like all I had were these once a week meetings to hang out and shoot the shit with these other baby dykes. And it's just not the same. I felt more isolated. Not me feeling different. I think it was just feeling different. Like I I can't talk about my breakup or my crush with this girl in homeroom, you know, like everyone else. But I'll wait until Saturday. Yeah, that group saved my life and many other youth. When your identity is not represented anywhere. You know, like I didn't grow up in a city. I mean, obviously Buffalo is a city, but it's not like New York City. You know, there is no vibrant like gay neighborhood per se. I think when the only thing you have, when you're trying to figure out when you're a teenager, like what it means to be a lesbian and the only representation is a religious sin or something, there, there was no representation. Not even Ellen was a show yet, you know? So from the moment I came out, it was very clear to me that the gay community is everything. It's not just a place where you go to a bar, you know, and pick up girls. Obviously, that's a big part of it. But the community part is a lifeline for what it means to be a queer person in this world for many, many people, and that's what that organization did for me. The first time where I felt like a living, breathing, lesbian, baby dyke out in the world was the first time I stepped foot on a college campus. I went to Sarah Lawrence College, which is like uber, uber gay, and It just was like, I don't even know what. It was like a kid in a candy store. Because honestly, to be a lesbian was you were top of the food chain, you know? For me, it was like sexual, not just sexual freedom, but just like there was a piece that I wasn't able to express all these years out in the world. 
and now it's just part of me, like just another appendage to my identity. And then, of course, you know, it's Sarah Lawrence is a half hour metro ride north uh, to Manhattan. So the other big piece of that was New York City and New York City's nightlife and Christopher Street. I had to work in the city in order to pay for a lot of college. That's how I started working in restaurants and bars. I mean, the nightlife in 8990 New York was just a sight to behold. I think that I probably went a little crazy with it. And I think that I must have missed out on a lot of the things in high school that other um, straight kids went through in terms of relationships and crushes because I felt like I was living through that in college. And I think that, you know, looking back, I had a lot of really disastrous relationships or attempts at relationships. Um, I feel like I was just catching up. The first time I was in New York City, surrounded by all the other queer people, whether it was the Christopher Street Pier or even just Christopher Street or the West Village or going out to these different bars, it was mind, like literally mind blowing. It was like I took a drug, you know, and you think, oh, the world is this way. And you take the pill and you're like, oh, no, the world is not that way. <laughs> like, the world is nothing like that. The world is this way. And this way is so much better. I remember one party I was at on the Christopher Street Pier. It was a DJ and it was like wall to wall people. And everyone was dancing. I don't remember who was spinning. And I look up and on one end of the, the pier is this like gorgeous, beautiful boy on the shoulders of the crowd. And next to me, I was at the other end of the pier, was another gorgeous, stunning, beautiful boy. And the two of them were voguing and battling each other from opposite ends of the pier. And slowly, the crowd was moving them towards each other. And it was like a religious moment for me. You know, it was a combination of both the music and the dance and throngs of queer people from all walks of life celebrating through music and dance and just being there, being like gay as fuck, you know? I always wrote, always stories and fiction. In fact, when I was in middle school, I used to, uh, for lunch money, I would basically write soft porn for my friends. So my friends would be like, okay, I want to be in a limousine with Simon Le Bon after a Duran Duran concert. And then I'd write them the story, right? And then they would give me lunch money. <laughs> so, yeah, so I was, I was always writing. I did lots of starts and finishes and everything. Unfortunately, my calling is uh, like writing a novel, um, and I don't suggest it when you're like 19. So it, it took me a while to figure that part out, but that's always been something that's been very much, you know, a part of who I am. From the beginning, I just wrote my reality as I saw it, which was all my characters were gay. <laughs> and it was just, you know, it wasn't a coming out story. It wasn't this or that. It was just the way the world was. Sexuality was just this, you know. And I remember I did finish a novel, you know, not that it was very good or anything, you know, and I showed it to a, a couple people, and this was in the 90s, and both of them said, like, this is a great story, and you're a really good writer, but there's absolutely no way I can sell this. And so it was what it was. And I think, like, the past 10 years have changed dramatically, and for me as a writer, it's apples and oranges, you know, opportunities for writers to write from different perspectives and different identities. You know, it's wide open. I think being a queer woman has greatly influenced my writing because I feel as though, especially now, one of the 
most important things to happen as you get older is perspective. And I think that you gain perspective on what you've been through that you cannot see when you're in it. And being queer has dramatically influenced my writing in that I feel as though I live many different identities, queer being one of them, as part of a legacy of what is not okay and what is not acceptable and living in defiance of that and existing and loving in defiance of that and being able to write in defiance of that. And I think that that defiance is definitely a part of my fiction. You know, I feel like sometimes I write things and people will tell me, you know, I just assumed that the narrator was a man because they were talking about a woman. They're like, you should really, you know, do something like she or whatever, whatever. And I'm like, no, I shouldn't. I think that in that way, it's influenced me as a writer in being very confident in my assumptions and not the world's assumptions, the stories that are important to me and the voices that I want to tell the story. All that we have in this world and on the brief time that we are blessed to be alive is the love that we are able to share and that It's neither easy or even at times necessarily abundant. But to understand that being queer, whatever that means, is something that is one of the most beautiful and powerful things in the world, you know, because because it's love. You're loving another person. It will come to you you know, in your travels and in your paths, in your life, it will come to you where you will find people who love and support you as exactly the person who you are. Thank you for listening. For more, subscribe to Sundays at Cafe Tobac, the podcast. You can learn more about us and our film at cafetobacfilm.com and at Cafe Tobac Film on social media. Please share your thoughts with us on our social media. And if you have a coming out story you'd like to share for a possible feature here, reach out to us. Thanks for listening.